Well, as I've said, I've already read the text in order to save just a bit of time, so now let's uh, take a look at it, beginning with a review of what we saw last Lord's Day. Remember last week we saw Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist at the Jordan River, and the reason was so that uh, John might be able to identify Jesus uh, to show Israel who the Messiah is, but also that Jesus might identify with us. Remember, Jesus came into this world to stand in our place, uh, to virtually do everything that we were supposed to do but failed to do. And um, that's the reason why he submitted himself to John's baptism, in order that he might express uh, to Israel and to his father his perfect hatred of sin and his perfect love for everything that is right. That's essentially what the baptism was meant to symbolize, and Jesus was the only one who actually had that, in his heart, but Jesus needed to do that in order to save us. We saw Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Spirit of God was the one that conceived uh, Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He's the one who created the union between the, the two natures, his divine and human nature. The Holy Spirit had been Jesus' companion throughout his life up to this point, teaching him and guiding him and helping him to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. But at his baptism, he was also um, anointed okay, with the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit of God is poured out upon the Lord Jesus in the same way that the prophets and the priests and the kings of Israel were all anointed with that holy anointing oil as a symbol of the Spirit's uh, being poured out upon them to equip them for their ministry. So the Father poured his Spirit out on Jesus to give him the power to complete the mission the Father had sent him into the world to do. And then finally, we saw the Father's delight in his Son and his public approbation, his public approval of everything that Jesus had done up to this point when he said from heaven in the presence of all, you are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Let's not forget that that is what the Lord is working in us through His Word and by His Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus came into the world, to make us like Him, so that in everything we do, we might also be pleasing to the Father. When we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are positionally pleasing to Him, in Him, but our lives begin to reflect His character as the Spirit of God continues to work in us. Now, this morning we see the first battle of Jesus' public ministry as the Spirit of God leads him now into the wilderness to fight against the devil. And here we see or want to look at three things. First of all, that the devil attempts to tempt Jesus in the same way that he did Adam and Eve in the garden. Secondly, how he goes about tempting him. And thirdly, how Jesus ultimately defeats him. And again, this is a lesson for us on how to do the same because the devil's going to tempt us. He's going to do it in the same way. And the way we need to defeat him is exactly the same way that Jesus did. So first of all, the devil tries to tempt Jesus in the way that he tempted Adam and cause him to fall. Now, Jesus, as we see in Scripture, is, is called the second Adam. Uh, He is the one who must do now what the first Adam failed to do. He needs to face the tempter, and he needs to overcome him. Now, we do need to recognize that this isn't the first time that the devil has tried to destroy Jesus, has tried to overcome him. The devil had already uh, moved upon Herod, remember, to send his soldiers to kill all the boys who were two years old and younger in and around Bethlehem, in order that he might kill Jesus and stop him from doing what he came into the world to do. I think we should also assume that the devil was active during Jesus' childhood years, trying to get him to fall into some sin so that he might destroy him. Remember that Jesus is the spotless Lamb of God. And if Jesus had not been spotless, if he had not been sinless, then salvation would not have been possible for any one of us. 
We know that the devil will continue to attack Jesus throughout his ministry, uh, mainly through the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, whom Jesus will say are of their father, the devil. But this is the devil's first attempt to stop Jesus in his tracks at the very beginning of his mission. And I want us to notice three things about this encounter as we begin. First of all, that the devil was attempting to destroy the head of a new humanity. He was trying to destroy not only Jesus, but he was actually trying to destroy all of us by destroying him. He knew that when he attacked Adam, that Adam being the, the head of the whole human race and his decision would affect all of us, if he could just get Adam to fall, he could destroy all of us at one time. And you know what? Um, the Bible says the devil actually succeeded in that. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 18, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. David talks about in Psalm 51 how he was conceived in sin and brought forth in iniquity. He was already guilty. He already had an evil heart. He was already condemned. And that's exactly how we come into the world because the devil was successful in defeating the head of humanity, that is Adam. Now, if he could just get Jesus to fall, the result would be exactly the same. So hypothetically, if Jesus had given in to any of the devil's temptations, all of us <clears throat> would have been condemned. If Jesus had failed at any point, none of us could be saved. There would be no salvation, and the condemnation that we were under when we came into the world would continue to the end of our days, and we would die and we would end up in hell. Now, secondly, I want us to notice that the devil attacked, well, I should say, where he attacked Adam in a garden, he attacks the second Adam in the wilderness. And this is simply a reminder that Adam's fall turned essentially the creation, which God meant to be a paradise, in, <clears throat> into a wilderness. And I think that's reflected by where this uh, temptation actually takes place. But I also want us to know that Jesus' success is going to turn the world back into a paradise when he comes again. You know, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ is not only to reverse the effects of the fall upon each one of us who are trusting in him, to make us new creatures uh, spiritually, and then to perfect us when we enter into heaven, and then when he comes again to uh, basically uh, renovate our bodies and, and uh, remove the effects of the fall from them. But his work was meant to reverse the effects of the curse upon all of creation. And the only thing that his life and death will not be effective in recreating would be the bodies and souls of those who do not trust in him. And then thirdly, I want us to notice this, that Adam was a perfect man. Eve was a perfect woman. God made them to be perfect. He put them in a perfect place. He gave them a perfect heart towards the Lord. But we know from Scripture that it was possible for Adam and Eve to change. And they did change under the devil's temptation. But we do need to recognize with Jesus as he comes out to face the enemy in the wilderness that he cannot change. Jesus, uh, the author to the Hebrews, tells us in Hebrews 13, verse 8, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That has to do with his divine nature. That has to do with his divine person. And because Jesus is a divine person, he always will choose what is right. We need to recognize at the outset the devil had no chance of success in his tempting of Jesus. No chance at all. Jesus was really tempted. He felt the temptation, but there was no possibility that Jesus would ever fall to it because there was no possibility that, that God would fail to save the people he sent his son into the world to fail. But I want you to notice the devil tried anyway, didn't he? I mean, he should have known. He's, he's the one who has this vast intelligence and wisdom, and yet he's still, knowing who Jesus is, he still tries to defeat him. That's why Jonathan Edwards... And I say this guardedly because we don't want to make fun of the devil, but he's the one who called the devil the greatest blockhead who ever existed. And what he meant by that is being so wise, he would do something so stupid and so foolish that had no chance of success, but 
He tries it anyway. So again, that's what sin does. That's what wickedness does. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. Why would somebody who knows this even attempt to do something like this? Why would anybody who knows the right thing to do do the wrong thing? That's what sin does to us. But Jesus did not have any sin, so he would not choose to do anything against God's will, certainly as the devil always did. Now, the second thing we see is how the devil went about his attack. He tempted Jesus in three particular areas, basically the same three areas that John warns us against in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. Uh, again, the things that the devil's going to use against us, where, where John writes this. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And what does he mean by the things that are in the world? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Okay? These are the things that Satan uses to try to attack us. He tries to appeal to our bodily desires. He appeals to our eyes. He appeals to our desire for greater self-worth or what we call pride. These are the same three that he used against Eve in the garden, and they succeeded. After he finished his temptation, we read this in Genesis 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that is, in, in her mind she understood this would, would, would taste good, okay? It appealed to the desire of her flesh or her bodily desires, and that it was a delight to the eyes, okay? It was appealing to her eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. In other words, it would you know, bolster her self-worth. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Notice that the way that Satan approached Eve caused her to fall by appealing through these three different avenues. Now, this is the same way that, that the tempter approaches Jesus. First of all, he appealed to Jesus' bodily appetites. Now, again, Jesus didn't have any sinful desires, but as we saw him pray in the garden, or we will see him pray in the garden, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. He didn't have the desire to suffer and die and face his Father's wrath on the cross. That's not what he wanted. He had the desire for self-preservation. He had those as a part of his makeup being in our nature. So the devil appeals to this. Now, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days, and during that time, Luke tells us the devil had already been tempting him. But afterward, he was hungry. Now, we know from our experience that uh, when a person fasts for this long, when he begins, the hunger disappears, and when the uh, hunger returns, then we need to eat or we're going to starve to death. Jesus needed to eat. The devil knew that. And so the devil challenged Jesus. If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. You need to eat Jesus. Why don't you feed yourself? And at the same time, prove that you're the Son of God by doing this miracle. So the first appeal is to his bodily appetite. Secondly, he appealed to Jesus' eyes. We read in verses 5 through 7. And he led him up, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Notice he showed him all this wealth, all these kingdoms, and all this glory. And he says to Jesus, Isn't this why you came into the world? To rule the nations? Isn't that what the prophets say? I can give all these things to you. Okay, so he's appealing to Jesus' eyes. And then finally, he appeals to Jesus' sense of self-worth in verses 9 through 11. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you do not strike your foot 
against a stone. Haven't you come to show Israel that you are the Messiah? Well, then go to Jerusalem, the largest and most important city in Palestine. Uh, go up to the highest point of the temple, which would be the most public building in Jerusalem, and throw yourself from there. In other words, jump off, okay? And when the angels come to rescue you, which the Psalms say that that's exactly what will happen, everyone will know that that is who you are. Now, I want you to notice, again, the devil uses these three avenues and, and also notice the shrewdness of his attack. He knows who Jesus is. If he, basically, he's not saying, if you're the Son of God. He knows he's the Son of God. What he's saying is, since you are the Son of God, do this. In other words, since, you're, since you are, then do the things the Son of God can do. He knows who Jesus is. He even knows why Jesus came into the world. He came into the world to save mankind. He came into the world to rule the nations. And so he offers him things that are in line with his mission. You know, I don't know if we recognize this, but he essentially did the same thing to Adam and Eve. Remember that Adam and Eve um, were made in God's image. God made them to reflect his image. I mean, they are, we are the image of God, although Adam and Eve more so because they had the kind of heart that God wants us to have and that we will have one day when we leave this world, a, a perfect heart of love towards him. But God made them to reflect his image. And what does the devil come to them and offer to them except when you eat of this tree, you will be like God. This is what God made you to be. Just eat of this tree and you'll be just like him. You see, he's offering things in line with what Adam and Eve believed was good and he's offering Jesus things in line uh, with what Jesus would think were good things. And they would be, perhaps, under uh, a different context, okay? So what he's doing is presenting to Jesus good things, but an alternate way of actually getting those things. So finally, how does Jesus see through the deception and defeat him? Well, first of all, he does it by knowing his enemy, and secondly by comparing what the enemy is saying to what is written and making choices that are in line with the truth, okay? First of all, he knows his enemy. He knows who the devil is. He knows the nature of what the devil says. And we need to know that as well. This is what Jesus says about him in John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So the first thing Jesus knows, and we should know as well, that whatever the devil says is going to be contrary to the truth. It's going to be a lie. Secondly, Jesus knows the truth, and he knows how to apply it. I mean, how do you recognize a lie? Well, one way is because the person who's telling you is a liar, but, but the second way is by knowing what the truth is, right? And Jesus knows that truth. When the devil tempted Jesus to take care of his need by turning the stone into bread, Jesus knew that the truth, that bread was not the most important thing, but God's word was the most important thing. Notice his response in Luke 4, verse 4. He says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Yeah, Matthew's gospel uh, tells us that Jesus uh, went a little further in this statement and said this in Matthew 4, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, okay? Obedience is better than meeting my need is what Jesus is saying. If I put the Father first, he is going to take care of my needs. You notice Jesus did that with, with the woman on the well. Remember how the disciples went into the city to get food and he spoke to the woman at the well. They came back out and they tried to give him food. And Jesus said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And they began wondering, did somebody come and slip him some food while we were gone? And he said, my will or my, my food is to do the Father's will and to accomplish his purposes. 
Jesus put God's concerns first over his own concerns of you know, meeting his even, even the necessities of life, knowing that being in the Father's hands, the Father would take care of him. So again, he counters with God's word and God's truth. When the devil offered to give Jesus the kingdoms of the world, if he would worship him, Jesus responded in this way in Luke chapter 4, verse 8. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus came into the world to worship his Father and to honor him. God alone is to be worshiped and served. He would gain this kingdom, but he would do it in a way that honored his Father. He would not compromise. And when the devil tempted Jesus to throw himself from the temple to prove to the Jews that he was their Messiah, this time even using the scriptures, I want you to know that Satan knows the scriptures. And he knows how to use them to tempt you and me to do something against the scriptures. As a matter of fact, um, you'll, you'll find when you, when you see churches, for instance, that are practicing things that are clearly against the, the Bible, uh, for instance, and I'm not trying to single out any particular group, but the example happens to come to mind. There, there are churches that are essentially homosexual churches, pract full of practicing homosexuals, right? The Bible says homosexuality is, is sin and that those who practice it will not inherit the kingdom of God. But they not only practice it and they get married, but they think they have God's approval. Okay, well, why in the world would they do that? Well, because Satan knows how to use Scripture to deceive. I read an article in the, the newspaper regarding this. Okay, and what was the verse that they use? Well, in Jesus Christ, there's neither slave nor free or Jew or Gentile nor male nor female. We're all one in Christ. So there's no male, there's no female. Uh, we can be essentially whatever we want to be and we can cohabit however we want to cohabit. Okay, now, why would I say that? And why does the Lord tell us that? He says it because he wants the people to know who are practicing that particular sin, that they will not inherit the kingdom of God unless they repent of that sin and turn to the Lord Jesus. They don't have his approval. They don't. They're going to be destroyed for that sin, but Satan has deceived them using the scriptures to do it. We have to make sure that we do not let Satan pit scripture against scripture. There's only one truth, and God does not contradict himself. If he says it's sin, he's not going to say somewhere else it's okay. Okay, so Satan uses scripture. We need to be aware of that. So how does Jesus answer the devil when he says, it's God's will that you should do this, and he's going to send his angels Jesus answers and says to him in verse 12, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, Jesus essentially was saying this, that he was not going to put himself in harm's way and force the Father's hand to prove that he was the Messiah by, again, putting his life in danger. The Father had his way of doing it, and he was going to do it in his time and in his way. Now, we read lastly that when the devil saw that he could not deceive Jesus and overcome him so as to destroy him, he left him into, until an opportune time. Now, Satan will continue to attack Jesus throughout his ministry, but we know the opportune time is going to come when Jesus says to the leaders of Israel that the power of darkness is yours. I've been handed over to you for a time so that he might be crucified, so that he might take away our sins. Now, we need to realize that what Jesus experienced in the wilderness is, again, not unique to him, but something that, that we also are going to have to deal with, okay? And we need to realize that the devil or one of his allies, okay, the world, the flesh, or one of his demons they also want to destroy us as well, which is why Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, let's step back for just a second and think about this. Okay, we have an enemy that wants to destroy us. Do you realize the Bible tells us that the devil has been very successful 
in, in doing what he does. He's not just trying to destroy Christians. He's trying to destroy the people of the world. The Bible tells us that he will actually succeed in destroying most of the people who will ever live in this world. Okay, that's what Jesus means when he says this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. And by the way, once you've entered, there's no hope. I mean, this, is, this leads to destruction. Many people are on that path, the vast majority of mankind. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Okay, how many people are going to be saved and how many people are going to be lost? Jesus actually tells us here, not the exact number, but he gives us ratios. How many are going to be lost? Many. How many are going to be saved? Few. The vast majority of mankind currently is walking on the broad road to destruction. And why is that? Because their hearts are evil? Because they came into this world sinful and wicked? Because the devil is keeping them deceived? Paul says that one time our eyes were also blinded by the God of this world and we were following him. That's exactly what the world is doing. Satan is very good at what he does, which is why we need to make sure that we watch out for him. Satan can't destroy us if we belong to Jesus, thankfully, but he can still do a lot of things to hurt us. And if we're not aware of his tactics, he is going to do that and he is going to rob from us, and we're going to be ineffective, and we're not going to honor the Lord as much as we should, and we're not going to receive the reward we might otherwise receive, and there may be people who will perish because we don't reach out to them, because we're so confused and deceived by the enemy into thinking that what other people are doing is okay, that we're not going to speak up and tell them what they need to hear in order that they might actually be saved. So how can we overcome the enemy? What can we do? First of all, we need to, if we're outside of Christ, turn to Him in faith, trust Him, turn from our sins, trust in Him. Uh, if we're genuinely repenting of our sins and we're actively trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, which we can only know that we are, not because we pray to prayer, not because we happen to believe these things are true, but because we love Him and are actually following Him, we're doing what Jesus was doing out there in the wilderness when we're confronted with a temptation. We choose to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing, and we do that because we love the Father as Jesus loved the Father. If that's what we're doing, then we know that we've trusted Jesus. Now, again, we're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to fail and fall many times. But if that's our desire and we keep getting up, we keep moving forward, that's how we know. If that's true of us, then we are safe. As I've said, the devil can still do us a lot of harm but he cannot destroy us. So if you're not trusting Jesus, that's where you need to begin. Secondly, if you are trusting Jesus, then we do need to understand how the devil attacks. We, we need to understand that he's going to attack in the same three ways that he attacked Adam and Eve, that, that he attacked Jesus, that John says he's going to attack us. He's going to appeal to our flesh. He's going to present things to us that we crave, you know, and try to get us to, to indulge in those things. He's going to attack us through our eyes. He's going to show us things that he knows that we want to try to captivate our hearts and to get us to go after those things, things that are good as well as the bad. Remember uh, Pilgrim's Progress and as, as they're going through Vanity Fair and here are things that are lawful and unlawful that can tempt a pilgrim from the path that's what the author to the Hebrews meant, the things that can um, basically weigh us down and the things that can entangle us, the sin entangles us, the things that are lawful that we become ensnared by will weigh us down. And he's also going to appeal to our pride. He's going to expose us to things that uh, we think are going to sort of enhance our self-worth and make us look better in our own eyes and in the eyes of others and he's going to do all these things in such a way that, that uh, we're going to think that they're good rather than bad. You know, I don't know if, if you remember Thomas Brooks and his, his, um, his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, reminds us 
that uh, Satan is a very good fisherman. He's a master fisherman. He has his hooks, but he knows how to hide those hooks. He knows how to bait his hooks with the things that we want. He knows how to ensnare us. You know, the, the fish doesn't think when he bites on that, on that hook that he's going get, to get hooked. He thinks he's going to get this, this piece of food that he wants, this, this worm, right? Well, Satan is going to bait his hooks with things that he knows that we want. He knows our weaknesses, and he, he knows how to use them against us to his advantage. So, finally then, knowing how he's going to attack us, we need to, as Peter reminded, reminded us just a moment ago, we need to be on the alert. We need to know he's coming. We need to look out for him. We need to know when and where he's going to attack. We need to know our weaknesses. And we need to strengthen ourselves against that. We need to buttress ourselves. We need to remember, too, that Jesus came into the world in order to equip us for this battle. And he's given us two very important things that will help us overcome our enemy. He's given us his word, and he's given us the Holy Spirit. So how are we going to be able to see through Satan's lies? When he comes to us, we need to read and study the Bible. Now, you know, the, the devil's also going to deceive us into thinking we already know enough. We already know everything we need to know. We don't need to study it. I have a general idea of what it says, but you know what? A lot of our ideas of what the Bible actually says aren't even true. You know, we, we have been deceived by the enemy. Others have been deceived. We've, we've basically adopted their opinions. When we need to get into the Word, Jesus didn't say, well, I heard it said somewhere, or the majority of Israel believes, you know, when the devil came to him, he said, it is written, Satan, it is written. This is the truth, which means you're lying, and I'm going to stand on the truth. So we need to read and study the Bible if we're going to see through the devil's lies. And then we need to be filled with the spirit that Jesus gives to us so that knowing the truth and knowing what the lie is, we'll choose what is right and turn away from what's wrong. If we do that, we'll be safe. Remember how Pilgrim, every time Christian got off the path in Pilgrim's Progress, he got into trouble? It got hard to walk on that path sometimes. He was tempted to get off the path, and it's going to be hard if we live according to God's truth. It's going to be hard. We're going to see this evening how much people are going to hate us for holding the truth. It's hard to walk on the straight and narrow path. But every time we get off the path, it always gets us into worst difficulty, right? We need to stick to the path no matter how difficult it is if we want to be safe. So we need to listen to the Word of God and we need to do it. You see, if we, if we don't do that, if we don't know the truth, if we don't want to do the truth, if we don't submit to the truth, we're going to be nothing other than sitting ducks, like shooting ducks in a barrel. It's going to be so easy for Satan to overcome us. So may the Lord give us the wisdom to follow the example that Jesus gives to us to be wise in the truth, in, in what God says, and to use the means that God gives to us, which includes worship, reading the word prayer to fortify ourselves, to strengthen us in the spirit of God so that we will be able to resist the devil so that he will flee from us. At the end of this encounter, it's the devil who leaves, right? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, we're not supposed to be running away from the devil. We're supposed to be facing him when, again, when pilgrim fought the devil, uh, Apollyon, he noticed in his armor that there was nothing to, to protect his hindquarters, and he realized if he turned tail and fled, that, that the devil would kill him. So he had to stand his ground and fight against him, and essentially that's what the Lord wants us to do. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you when you do it the Lord's way. So may the Lord encourage us through his word this morning to do that, that we might be strong and that we might be able to do what the Lord has called us to do in this world. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we?